Hello and welcome. I finished The Living World Season 2 for Guild Wars 2, uh, getting ready to dive into Heart of Thorns and really excited to get to that. But I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about my thoughts on Living World Season 2. Uh, right off the bat, Living World Season 2, you don't get this for free. You have to pay for this. Uh, it's in gems. It's not super expensive, but still was kind of a shame. Uh, I get why you have to. If you got it when it first came out, you get it for free, right? Uh, but coming back later, this game has no subscription. This is how they pay for everything. I get it. I'm not going to complain too much about that, and that's not going to be the whole breadth of this video. But I did want to mention it for anybody that's excited or that has seen the series of videos so far and is like, oh man, I can't wait to get the Living World Season 2. Uh, you do have to pay for it, but I do think it's worth it, and we'll get into that here. Uh, spoilers from here on out, basically, but Living World Season 2 uh, is a big step up from Living World Season 1, I think, so far. Uh, now, granted, we just have those couple episodes of Season 1, uh, but it is a step up even from the base story of the personal story. It is really, really interesting. Gives a lot of questions that some of which get answered, some of which don't. But it also introduces new areas, which I think is really cool. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect to get new areas as part of the living world. Uh, right off the bat, getting Dry Top. And I did complete my Return to Dry Top achievement while I was there. Uh, Dry Top is a really cool zone. I liked that a lot, going into the, from the Brisbane Wildlands and into the Seraph base and then getting in there, going with the whole crew, getting to rock around with Marjorie and Casimir and Timey and Bram and Rox, uh, felt really cool. But Dry Top as a zone was really interesting and right off the bat was like, hey, the Zephyrites have crashed. I didn't know who the Zephyrites were up until it started slowly unraveling and I feel like if the rest of season one was out, I probably would. I don't know that for sure. Uh, but slowly unraveling the mystery of the Zephyrites and figuring out what's going on there, uh, trying to help them repair what they've got and not really being able to do much to help them, but exploring Dry Top and everything there. Dry Top's a really interesting zone with the sandstorms and the stages that you build up to be able to buy more things from the uh, Zephyrite NPCs, the merchants. It was a really fun zone to complete, one that I'm really glad I went ahead and completed the Return to Dry Top achievement for, because I really enjoyed my time with Dry Top. Uh, but story-wise, going through this canyon and slowly building things up, tracking down the Master of Peace and uh, cornering our target, the Saboteur, uh, was really cool. I didn't enjoy that fight all that much, but... Part of my problem was that I was playing a very squishy Hollowsmith for the first part of this. Towards the second half, I did switch to a much tougher Scrapper for my Engineer uh, spec that I found to be really satisfying for story content uh, because I get just a little bit more tankiness that stops me from going down all the time. I really, like I said, I didn't really enjoy this boss fight that much, but... Story-wise, I thought it was really interesting. And the fact that the Master of Peace was on the run, and we didn't know why, and he wouldn't really tell us why, but it was important that he needed to get away, I found all of that really interesting. Uh, then from there, we were going to Prosperity and trying to figure out what happened with Scarlet and everything there. And we got to see more about why Timey was, you know, interested and what Scarlet was doing and get a little bit more backstory there and finding Scarlet's uh, experiments and... All of that was really fun, just getting to spend more time with these characters. Again, I don't have all the episodes of Season 1 available to me, so I'm meeting a lot of these characters really for the first time. Like Obviously, I met Bram and Rox and Jory and Casimir, uh, and then got introduced to Timey pretty quick, but I'm getting to actually spend time with them in Season 2, and I'm really enjoying that. I think that the main cast of characters that call you boss are all really cool. So that first episode, Gates of Maguma, was pretty solid, right? Then we get into Entanglement, and this is where things really start to, to ramp up, right? Going through, hey, there's not just a lab, but there's a back door, and if we follow through it, we can find a full, like, underground segment that we have to, to work our way through. And all that was really cool. But where Episode 2 grabbed me, where it all started to come together is with Fort Salma and Belinda. And we met Belinda in Gates of Maguma, but the Fort Salma situation, it was kind of like the moment with Forgel Kernson in the main game, but it hit so much harder for me. And then later on, the stuff with like Tan, right? But it hit so much harder for me because, hey, this isn't just an NPC that I got to interact with and I thought was cool. 
This is one of my crew's sister, and she's very obviously affected by it. And at the same time that you have Belinda's death and the realization that Mordremoth is a problem, right? These vines are a huge issue. You also have Jory and Cass and their interactions together and the worry that is Jory going to be able to come out of this? Is she going to be able to pull it together? And I just found that really interesting. I think that Belinda's death is a great surge forward for this story uh, in a way that I really didn't expect. I didn't think they would kill off Belinda. We get the machine and everything and, and entering the device, giving a vision. That's all really interesting. Uh, but it, it doesn't really, I guess the way I want to word it here is it doesn't really come together until much later. So at this point it doesn't really mean much, right? But where it goes is, crazy it's our job to take out the dragons and to protect the thing which I, I don't know why i'm not it's all spoilers to protect the egg that we're going to get introduced later from there we get into dragon's reach part one and part two uh which are pretty interesting episodes it's hey you know go to the audience at the pale tree but before you can do that to talk with the Pale Tree and everybody, you have to go gather up all of the world leaders to be able to come to the summit. And so you go to the Iron Marches and you help them and kill some Mordrum to be able to, to win your chance in to get to talk to everybody. And you figure out the stuff with the waypoints and then you start sending out the invitations. And all of this is good, right? All of this is solid. All of this is slowly building up to big moments. You have to, to earn the right to be able to talk to the different leaders, and it makes sense. You may be the pack commander, but at this point, why do they owe you anything? You killed Zaitan, that's great, but you're just the commander of the pack. You're not, you know, anybody... You're great, but... Why does Newt Whitebeard have anything to owe you, you know? And so, you you build that up, and you help Ritlock, and then Ritlock leaves, and it's unsure if he's coming back or not. And the rest of the rest of the party, Destiny's Edge is there, right? Later on, without Ritlock, because he's gone. You get everybody convinced to help with Smoder and New Whitebeard, and you go to the party uh, with Cass, and the party was fun. I really enjoyed that sequence, trying not to gain too much suspicion while you work your way through. That was all really cool. But you get that, and then you get what is both one of the coolest and one of the most annoying ones to me, which is the waypoints with the Asura, with Flunt. That's their Flunt. I couldn't stand Flunt, and the fact that we just let Flunt get away with everything is like, okay. All right, I guess we're doing that. But it does lead to an incredible moment, which is where Timey is on the cliff, and the inquest are slowly walking towards her. And it is very rare in video games that an NPC is endeared to me in a way that I get actually angry when that NPC is in trouble. Like, that I feel my blood pressure go up and I'm worried about that NPC. I care about NPCs and stories, obviously, but that I actively get worried instead of just going, oh, okay, yeah, this NPC is going to die. I was worried for Timey. I was upset for Timey, and I, I desperately wanted to save her. And to me, that tells me that you have endeared a character to me on a level that I did not expect you to be able to do, you know? So, obviously we rescue Timey. Uh, was not about to let the inquest touch her. Uh, my poor sweet child. And uh, we rescue her, and we have the summit. And the summit, it goes really well, but it also has a really good boss fight tied into it. It's very, very solid, and I had a lot of fun with that. The Pale Tree gets hurt. And that's not great. And things are, are going very poorly in a lot of places. Uh, but we go back to Fort Salma. And we have that moment with Belinda's ghost. That really got me. Uh, just Belinda come back from the dead to try and kill Mordromoth. Or to try and fight off Mordromoth's minions. Attacking random people. Because she assumes them to be Mordromoth's minions. And then... Marjorie sealing without meaning to, you know, winning her back over, and then Belinda sealing herself into the blade that Marjorie's gonna be carrying is just Whoa. That 
did not see that coming at all, but it's so beautifully tragic. The sister that has to carry on now wielding the spirit of her sister who just wants to protect her. It got me good, man. It got me good. And uh, Marjorie jumped up the list of my favorite characters in this game because of Belinda. And the, that interaction, I think it's really good. From there, we go back to Traherne, to my boy, and we get to talk to him a little bit about what's going on. And then we go rescue Case Squad and figure out what's going on there uh, with Kanak. And all of that is good, right? I think all of that is solid. It's good setup. There's some good, interesting fights there. And then we go into uh, a secret library. And we get to just read books for a while. And that was great. That's not what the mission's about. But I sat there and read all those books. I'm sure you've seen the short on this channel now of how excited I was to be in the library. I don't think the instances that followed were that great. I think that it's a cool idea, right? You can't damage this enemy, so you got to get the shield, and you have to be able to drop this shield on these black holes and hit them, and that sends the black hole into the or sends the shield into the enemy to be able to do damage to them. The problem is this enemy's throwing a lot of AOEs out. The little black holes have a lot of AOEs, and there's traps on the ground. And if you take any damage at all while you have one of those shields, your health is brought down to one, so you just immediately go down, which means that you go down, and then Marjorie picks you up. And then you go down again, and then Marjorie picks you up, especially since the shields can spawn on top of you. Um, did not have a lot of fun there, but finding out the egg and everything after that was really cool. Going into Glint's uh, lair, that was super cool, and finding out all the lore there. And then, of course, as quick as we got the egg, we lose it, because uh, Kate steals it, which is not great, and we have to figure out what's going on there. Uh, I guess before that, we tracked down the Aspect Masters, right, to try and find the Master of Peace. And uh, we figure out what's going on there, and we can't save the Master of Sun, but we're able to help the other two, and that's pretty cool. That fight was pretty solid. And then we go into the Labyrinth, and I didn't dislike the Labyrinth. It was very long, and it took a long time to get through, but it was a fun time uh, getting through there. I really enjoyed regathering the party and then going into that fight, uh, which had some interesting mechanics. And that's when, of course, Case steals the egg, and we have to go back and get the seeds of memory to be able to try and figure out what happened. And this is my favorite section of the game so far. Because you go back to the beginning for the Silvari. You get to see their introduction with the Asura, where they call them imps. Their early interactions with the centaurs because of Antari. You get to slowly work all this together. And you get to see what happened between Kaith and Fallon. And it's not pretty. It's bad, right? Because... These people were still learning. They were still growing. They are making the mistakes that an early civilization will do. And I found it so incredibly interesting. And it all leads to the realization that the weight that Kate carries is the death of Wynn. And I haven't really talked about the silver waste. I'll get into that in a minute because the, the back half of the story takes place there. But... Figuring out all of this, defending the base when it gets attacked, right? Going into that cave, fighting off that dragon, and eventually getting to kill that dragon uh, that attacked the Pale Tree was super cool. And as soon as you finish all of that, all that cool stuff, all these cool fights, all these cool events, you get to watch as the entirety of your plan falls apart. As the pact is just wrecked. As the airships are torn from the skies, as Mordramoth roars again, and the Silvari turn, and you can see Kanak desperately defending himself, saying that they are not monsters. And I felt actual fear, not just for the characters, but for my character, because my character is a Silvari. What does this mean all across the world? I've met all these wonderful people everywhere. How many of them have fallen to Mordramoth? How many of them have been killed by people that fell to Mordramoth? And it just... Very rarely does a game turn everything on its head like this. There's an incredible moment in Inwalker, uh, FF14 Inwalker, that turns everything on its head like this. And I found actual fear for the characters that I enjoy in this game. Because nobody's safe. Any Silvari can be turned. 
and could turn on anybody. I have a lot of predictions and a lot of worries. I think that, uh, hoping Ritlock comes back, obviously, but I'm thinking that, uh, and please don't spoil anything for me in the comments, but my assumption is that we're probably going to lose Zoja, Air, and Logan. And I really hope Traherne's okay. I love Traherne. I assume Kaith is going to be okay. Because we just got all that backstory on Kaith. And I think Kanak is probably going to be okay. I hope. But man, we'll have to see. Cause... And what if they get the Pale Tree? All in all, I guess we should talk about the Silver Waste before I, I wrap this up. I found the Silver Waste to be a really interesting zone. There is a constant meta that is going on here where there are these four bases that you have to defend and you have the script tunnels that have to be opened and it's all pretty cool. I'm missing one achievement for my return to Silver Waste, uh, which is to go underground and find the big chest under there because I just ran out of time when I was trying to do it in that labyrinth. I got into that labyrinth before I was in there for the story, actually. Uh, but it's been fun running around the Silver Waste. I wish the script tunnels weren't tied to getting into the areas for the story completion because I had to go do that script event a couple times to open it up because nobody else was doing it uh, to be able to get over there. But other than that, I, I found the Silver Waste to be a really fun zone. Living World Season 2 as a whole, I think, has been incredible. I'm really, really glad that I picked it up and played it before Heart of Thorns. Uh, I think that what is in it is really cool. You get two really good maps. You get a lot of mastery points. You get some great story. Uh, the stuff with Kaith and Fallon and Wynn is incredible. That is so heartbreaking. And I'll say it. This, this game's animations aren't always the great, right? So when I saw Kaith break down to start crying after killing Win, I was a little worried it looked a little goofy. I mean, if you've seen the dance emotes, sometimes they look a little goofy, but it was it was heartbreaking. And I think that Living World Season 2 has just made me more hype for what Heart of Thorns is going to be. Uh, there were some incredible moments in the personal story and some really good moments in Living World Season 1, but Living World Season 2 has definitely brought me up to a new high for Guild Wars 2 story, and I can't wait to see the rest. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below, and until next time, I've been Trey, this has been The Full Spectrum. Remember to always enjoy The Full Spectrum. The living world and Guild Wars 2 have to offer.